if you can stay. Uh, we are having a business meeting. It's going to cover the rest of the year to planning out the rest of the year. So if you can stay for that, please plan on staying. Matt said he'll make it fast. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> um, and then we hit October. If you've got the bullets and you can see, we hit October running. So it's going to be a great month. But uh, next Saturday, two things are going on next Saturday. One, if you're a part of the joy group in the church, they're going to Cancun's in Waxahachie to eat dinner next Saturday evening. If you can, please make plans to go. That's always a great time of fellowship and fun. Um, there is a sign-up sheet in the back, so if you can go, please try to sign up make, and make plans to go so that they can uh, get the room at the restaurant so that we can make sure there's enough people there. Next up, on the 5th, they're having a youth revival at Blooming Grove Church. So if you have a youth that's planning on going to that, please make plans for them. Let Alex know so that they can know who, how many people are coming. Um, this is a 100% free event. You don't see that very often, right? And then on the 12th, that's going to be a Saturday night. Right out here between the two buildings, we set up a movie projector out there. Usually throw it on rear projection mode, set up a sound system, and we have a good time sitting out here laughing and uh, talking more than watching. But anyway, have a great time out here watching a movie and fellowshipping. And there's usually popcorn and whatever else you want to bring and share with <clears throat> some of us other people. It's always a great time. And then the 26th, the ladies are going to have a breakfast up here. And then I don't know, I don't have to tell y'all, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it. What goes on the 31st here? Trunk or treat. Right? We want to fill up our parking lot with cars and kids. So if you can help, if you can have a car up here, open up a trunk, play a game, have kids come by, please sign up for that as well. Or talk to Heather. There, I was like... Where are we at? Heather, Heather right here. She'll be the one to take your name and uh, your car. And if you don't have a game for your car, there's things here at the church that we can use, we can give you, and you can put it in the back of your car and just sit there and enjoy the kids and, and the fellowship and things like that to go that are going to be going on because it's going to be a great, great afternoon. Today I'm going to end reading out of Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Because we all need that reminder for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Keep that in mind as we go out this week. God, we come to you today. We just thank you and we praise you for who you are. We praise you for what you're doing in and through us. God, we praise you for what you're doing in this church how you're bringing people in, how you're changing lives, God, how we're filling the baptistry up this year. God, thank you for our worship team and thank you for what they do every week, how they meet early and how they just, they meet during the week sometimes and God, practice and rehearse and the time that they put in, God. Thank you for Matt and the time that he puts into his messages, God, that he can bring us your word. Bring us your truth. God, we just praise you for being you and for loving us, God, even though we are so undeserving of it. God, be with us this week and help us to go out and glorify you and honor you in everything that we do, in everything that we say. Thank you for loving us in all these things. Amen. There we go. Amen. All right. I had somebody tell me this past weekend how much they loved when we let everybody get up and say hello to each other and greet. So uh, in order to, in order for them to feel loved this morning, take this first song if you want to. Stand with us. Walk around. Tell each other how much you love each other, how grateful you are to see each other.
soul, I need you. Oh God, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Dead men walk in the slave to sin.
every one of these super sweet songs today were centered around the love of Jesus. Every one of them talks about the love of Christ. And today we're going to actually read two chapters. We're going to finish up chapter 42. And chapter 42, man, it is, it is, it is a, uh, the end of the chapter is, is kind of condemning. And it's really rough. And I thought, man, I just really don't want to end there. I don't want to leave today, you know, especially with a business meeting. Everybody loves business meetings. You don't want to, you don't want to go into a business meeting with condemnation. And so I was like, Lord, what do I do? And I just kind of kept reading into chapter 43 of Isaiah. And God says, but for you, my people, I'm affectionate for you, and I love you. And I thought, man, what a great word. And so um, I don't even have to preach it. We're just going to read it. And we're going to let Jesus, and we're going to let God just tell us how, how much he loves us. And so that's kind of what we centered this set around. This song will tell us how much he loves us.
We're so thankful that you love us. God, it's easy. It's easy for us to say that we love you. But God, for you to love us after all we've done, after all of our sin, for you to be patient, long-suffering with us, and to still continue to love us. Lord, I just, I can't imagine. I can't imagine the love that you have for us. I can't fathom it. But Lord, I'm so thankful that you have it. God, we just pray. Father, we just pray that you would just bless us today, bless us by the hearing and the reading of your word. And, Father, that you would be glorified above all things. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we ask it all. Amen. Uh, 
All right. Not to sound super arrogant, but if you didn't get a blessing after that, you need to just go home. Uh, awesome stuff. I love it, too. I'll just be honest. I've told you guys this before. I love it when folks text and say, hey, I got this song on my heart. Can we do this one? So that set was kind of designed around different texts from different people. And so what a blessing when God gives different songs to different people and they all kind of work together. It's just he's he is the, the orchestrator of all of it. And we just get to be bystanders. We get to be vessels. And I'm thankful for that. All right, before we get started, if you're an adult here, uh, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 42 and chapter 43. We're going to end chapter 42. We're going to begin 43. Um, so we're kind of in a weird split there. We normally don't do stuff like that, but like I told you, it's, it's a good segue. Um, if you are a child here, ages three up through third grade, uh, you guys can go back now. Easy, babe. Love you. You guys can go back now for Children's Church. If you're a visitor here and you've got a kiddo, age three up through grade three in school, uh, you're more than welcome for them to go back for Children's Church. If you've got one younger than age three, they can go back to the nursery now. A couple of great ladies back there to take care of those babies. If they want to hang out in here with you, they are more than welcome to hang out in here with you. Kids don't bother me at all. Isaiah chapter 42. We start in verse 10 where we left off last week. And I love, love how this starts off. Actually, you know what? Just for a refresher, let's back up just for a minute. We talked about this servant at the end of chapter 42 that God is sending in we identified the servant, at least at the end of 42, as Jesus, that he gives him for, as a covenant for the people, a contract, a light for the nations, to open eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. And Isaiah writes and says this, because he is a God who knows the future, because he is a God who can tell us these new things before they spring forth, because he is a God who has offered a servant on our behalf who has offered one who has freed us from the darkness in the dungeon, he says our response should be that we sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and all their inhabitants, let the desert and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits, let, them inha let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastland. Amen? I'll tell you what, man, as an old worship leader, <clears throat> those, those verses hit. Those verses are strong. Some of y'all been singing this same old tired song for a long time. You know what happens with a song when you sing it over and over and over again? Wears out a little bit. No? <coughs> Some of them, you got to let them rest for a little bit. Right? I mean, you're at a baseball game and you hear Sweet Caroline come on. We're going to do the bum, bum, bum. You have to. It's like a national treasure at this point. But I'm going to tell you what. I could do without a little Taylor Swift in my life for just a little bit. Y'all don't clap at that. That's terrible. Sweet girl. Some of her songs, listen, unpopular opinion, some of her songs we jam in the car. We love them. Lucy sings them. She sings them, and it's the sweetest little thing. But I'm going to tell you something. There are songs on the radio right now that when they come on, I go, no. And I'm not just talking secular music. If you listen to KLTY, I need you to stop. Stop. The reason for that is they keep playing those same songs from 1980 because you keep listening to them. So if you stop listening to them, they'll go, hey, we should probably change the format. I'm like, do you know how many great Christian songs have been written 
from 1991 to now. Amazing Christian music. And you turn on 94.9, and I'm like, we did those songs when I was worship leading back in like 94, 95. Like I was like a child singing these songs. It is, it's just human nature. We gravitate to something we love. We run it into the ground to the point that it doesn't really have its pop and its, and its purpose anymore. The songs of today, did you even really sing them? Did you look at the lyrics and meditate on the lyrics and think, it really is well with my soul. He really does love us. Your love to me really is like radiant diamonds. It grabs my attention the same way it grabs my attention when I walk past a jewelry store and I see those big old 85 carat diamonds in the thing. I don't, I don't know nothing about diamonds. Do you sing those songs? And so Isaiah writes and says, it is time to sing a new song to the Lord. It is time to sing a song that is fresh and is exciting. And you are singing this song not because you are a great singer. You are singing this song because he is worthy of the glory. I'm singing this song and I'm not just barely singing it. I'm shouting it from the mountains, from the rooftops. And you go, Pastor, you don't want that. I sing in my little bubble over here. God, Nobody wants to hear me sing. You're right. We don't want to hear you sing. But the Lord wants to hear you sing. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Lord wants you to praise. I'm thankful that this church finally has gotten off of its hands just a little bit. Just being honest. Baptist churches, we have a history of side-eyeing people when they're trying to worship. And people would come up to me, and I love this expression when people would come up and they would go, you know, sometimes I really, really want to worship. I say, well, why don't you? Well, I just, you know, what would everybody else think? That's right. Who, who are you here to worship? You worshiping them? You worshiping them? Well, what if they have a problem with it? I don't, I don't want to cause division in the church. Do you know not one time in God's word? Well, that's not true. There was one time in God's word where there was division over worship. There was only one time in God's word, in the entire council of God's word, where there was division over worship. And it said that the Ark of the Covenant was coming back to Jerusalem and David, the king, danced undignified because the Ark was coming home, because God's glory was returning home. And his wife pulled him aside and said, hey, you're the king, don't you think you should be dignified? And his response was, hush up, woman. <laughs> if you understood what I understood, you'd be dancing too. He's like, dance, we're dancing. Now, look, sing a new song does not mean we break out with tambourines and we run up down the aisles. That's not what it means. All right? Just make sure, you, make sure you're awake back there. Sing the new song. Have this fresh song. Guys, I got I to gotta commend you, and I'm not saying this to butter you up. I'm not saying this because we're having a business meeting and I hope you stay. I'm saying this because... Over and over and over again in the last few months, the word that has been told to me about this church is people that have visited say it is a joy and it is a refreshment. I sat with a guy just a couple of weeks, me and Alex, and he looked at us. We're getting ready. We're going to join. Anthony Drive is going to join up with another association here around Ellis County. We are going to partner with churches to make a bigger and greater impact in Ellis County. We talked about our purpose. We talked about their vision. We were super excited. And the guy looked at me and said, we have visited churches. And he said, and Matt, he goes, I got to tell you, the last two or three we went into that applied with us, he goes, I left and went, Ugh. he goes, they were dead. And he said, I was so excited to walk into Anthony Drive. He said, number one, to fight for a parking spot, to fight for a seat. And he said, and number two, he said, when you told everybody to walk around and shake my hand, he said, to see the joy on their face. And guys, I'm going to tell you, that does not come from me. That does not come from music. That does not come from anything except for God is doing something in each one of you. And that is going to be contagious between all of you. 
That is that new song. That is that excitement of God is doing a work in my life and I need to tell somebody about it. God is doing great things for me and the joy of that is all over me to the point that I've just got to tell people. And so it's this exciting, exciting verse. Look at how many times just in this beginning of this verse. I want you to look at this. I wrote in my notes, this is a loud chapter in the beginning. He says, we are to sing, we are to praise, we are to lift our voice, we are to shout, we are to give glory, and we are to declare praise. Every one of those things you do not do quietly. Isaiah writes this, and in the very beginning, look at it, sing to the Lord, praise from the ends of the earth. Let the desert and its cities lift their voice. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise. Every one of those are loud action verbs. So if you came into church today planning to take a nap, wake up. Wake up. What time do cowboys play? Great. You got nowhere to go. You ain't got nobody to scream at this week. You got no TV to throw stuff at. So you know what? All that energy you would have saved screaming at a bunch of guys running with a ball losing, you can spend here screaming to the Lord. All right? By the way, just an aside, outside of Scripture, I'm going to tell you I do not appreciate every one of you that texted me and said, you jinxed them. I'm sitting at home, my phone just starts blowing up, and it's all these random texts coming through. Good, good going, Pastor. <laughs> the Bible says a prayer of a righteous man is fervent and powerful and effective. I prayed for them boys to lose, and look what happened. <laughs> what is the new song, guys? It's this. What is the new song? What is the joy that we sing about? What is the joy that we have on us? What is the praise that we're giving? It is, I was in chains and I was in darkness and you have come and freed me. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm singing and I'm shouting. Some of y'all done forgot. You forgot what it was like to be in chains. Some of you haven't been freed, so you're still sitting in darkness. Some of you are still caught up in your sin. So when I say sing to the Lord that he has freed you, you don't feel freedom, you feel conviction because you go, I don't know that I've been freed. The good news for you today is today is the day of the Lord's salvation. So if you're struggling, take it to him. God, you know my struggles. Don't patty cake it from him. Don't hide it from him. Well, God, I, you know, I struggle with this. He knows. He knows. He's fully well aware. He sees it. He knows the grief on you. Let me tell you a secret. If there's grief on you, and I've told you guys this a million times, if there's grief on you about your sin right now, if we're talking about sin and you feel that conviction, what a wonderful thing. Because God is either going to save you in that, or God is working through you in that. The Holy Spirit is working through that conviction. If you're sitting here and we're talking about your sin and you're getting ready to doze off, what a horrible thing. Because that sin is going to, you're going to doze off all the way to hell. But what a beautiful passage here. For those who were in darkness and you have seen a light, I need you to praise. I need you to shout. Look at what the Bible says about God Almighty. Look at this. For the Lord goes out, verse 13, like a mighty man, like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out and he shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. For a long time, I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. But now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and I will pant and I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers to islands and dry up these pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know in paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light. I will turn their rough places into level ground. These things I do and I do not forsake them. These things that I do and I do not left, leave them undone. They are turned back and utterly put to shame. 
those who trust in carved idols, those who say to metal images that you are our gods. God Almighty says, listen, if you want to know exactly who it is and what I, who I am and what I do, this is what I do. If you want to know why you should sing for glory, this is why. Because I take people who had no hope and I give them hope. That's what I do. That's the God that we serve. Do not buy into the lie that there is a mean, scary man sitting up in the clouds who wants to send you to hell. That is not God's design. That is not God's character. God's character is long-suffering. He is patient with us. He is loving towards us. He is benevolent towards us. If you don't believe that, ask yourself this question. After all the sin you have committed, why are you still permitted to be here? As parents, we use the phrase, I brought you into this world, and by Jove, I will take you out. God has that same authority over us that I should have been taken out a long time ago, but God is patient with me, so patient with me, where other people gave up on me because of my attitude, because of my addictions, because of my outlandish behavior, because of my anger, because of whatever. I've lost so many people in my life, and yet there is God Almighty steadily, Offering grace, offering mercy, offering forgiveness, carrying me, pushing me, rebuking me, all out of love to try to get me to where I am supposed to be. God says, I'm going out with this zealousness. He said, in the past, I have been quiet. But now for my people, he said, I'm coming with shouts. I'm coming with this loud, aggressive, terrific stance where no man can say that this is anything but God. Listen to me really quickly. In the last chapter, we heard where he says he came in and did not make a sound. And we attribute that to Christ. Every scholar, every commentator that I read attributed that in verse 41 to Jesus and said he came and like a lamb led to slaughter, he did not open his mouth and he went peacefully. And that's so true. He came the first time in gentleness and in love. And when Pilate accused him, when Herod accused him, when the religious leaders accused him, he sat and did not open his mouth. But guys, listen to me. There is coming a day when he will return and he will no longer be quiet. There is coming a day when the sky will rip open and Jesus will descend and there will not be one person on planet earth, the Bible says, who does not understand that is the Lord. What a day. Amen? I'll tell you something. It says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. I would much rather my knee bend willingly than be kicked out from underneath me. It's going to happen. So if you sit here today and you go, I will never. The Bible says you will. Well, he's going to have to force me down. Oh, he will. And you're not going to enjoy it. He's not going to make my tongue confess. Oh, he will. And you're not going to enjoy it. How much greater? How much greater to go before that time to pass on and to be with him and when he returns, to return with him with those shouts, with those trumpets and to know this is the Lord. Mm. Mm. Verse 18. We get into an awful, awful conundrum here with this bit of Scripture. This was difficult. I'm not going to lie to you guys. This was probably a piece of Scripture that I labored over more than anything I've ever studied out. I think the tabs are still open on my phone, on the iPad. I was sitting there trying 
to make sense of this. Verse 18 says this, Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. That's not difficult. That's easy. We're carrying on from those who have made their carved images and those who have worshipped their metal idols. You are deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Verse 19 is where we get tricky. Who is blind but my servant? Who is as deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness' sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. They have become plunder with none to rescue, spoil with none to say restore. And who among you will give ear to this and will attend and listen for the time to come? Who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not I, the Lord, against whom we have sinned? In whose ways they would not walk and whose law they would not obey? So the Lord poured out on him the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. I told you guys last week, there are three options when we talk about the servant of the Lord. Number one is Israel. Your heading in your Bible is going to say, mine says, Israel's failure to hear and see. The problem is that he is very singular. The second one I told you was Cyrus, the Persian king who is coming to free the slaves. That could fit for Cyrus. That God is using Cyrus. He is an instrument that God is using, and yet he himself will not hear. He will see it, but not understand it. His law will be magnified, Cyrus's law, Cyrus's reign will be magnified, God's righteousness will be seen in all of that. That could fit. Then we get to the third option where the servant is Jesus Christ. And we have a hard time reconciling that. that, that how is Jesus one who came and saw but didn't understand? He heard but he didn't really hear. That doesn't fit with the Lord because all through Scripture... Seeing but not understanding and hearing but not actually listening, not actually hearing, that's talked about with the unsaved. That can't fit with Christ. I labored over this. Who is the servant in verse 19? And you know what I discovered after much, much study? I don't know. I don't know. For once in my life, for once in my pastoral career, I don't know. Commentators are so split on it that I could stand here and I could make it fit with any individual person. I could bend it. But I'm going to tell you, interestingly, Interestingly, if we have applied this to Jesus, in, verse, or in chapter 43, the heading in my Bible is Israel's only Savior. So it's as if, whether that was Cyrus, whether that was the people of Israel, whether that was somebody, something else, they were hoping for salvation through themselves, salvation through Cyrus in chapter 42, and God says there will be salvation. But the one who leads you to salvation in that regard is not going to understand. They're not going to understand. If it's you, my people, you're not going to understand my true righteousness that I'm trying to fulfill. If it's Cyrus, Cyrus is going to give you freedom, but he's not going to understand the true righteousness of God. 
And that's why I struggled over these verses. I really did. If you look at, I even went this far. Put your doodad here. Go back to Isaiah chapter 11. A well-known verse, and we're going to come up on it in just a couple of months when Christmas rolls around. Isn't it very hard to believe that last year at Christmas time we were in these chapters, 9, 10, and 11? We've been in Isaiah for a minute, guys. Chapter 11 says this, very familiar. There shall, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch <coughs> from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now watch inside your quotations. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, there's a key word, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Pertaining to Christ, if we put Christ in there and we look at this and we say, how does Christ come and see without seeing and hear without hearing? Isaiah chapter 11 describes it to us. When Christ came, it's not that his eyes were dull like a sinner's eyes. It's not that his ears were dull like a sinner's ears. But when Christ came, he did not perceive with his eyes. Everything that they told him was unclean. Everything that the religious leaders said, you can't do that. You shouldn't go do that. Christ didn't judge by what his eyes saw. He did not judge by what his ears heard. He judged by the heart and the righteousness of God the Father. He judged in all truth. By all accounts, he should have walked into the temple. He should have seen the religious leaders. He should have seen the Pharisees. And he should have been like, you guys are super holy. I'm on your side. And those sinners over there that are living in their sin, boy, those guys are worthless. That's what he should have done if his eyes were attuned to that secular world. Guys, I'm going to tell you a secret. You want to be happy? in your walk with Christ, and I know some people are going to battle me. All my Reformed friends are sitting out there right now going, it's not about your happiness. I think God wants you to be happy. I think God wants you to, God wants you to have joy in this world. I don't think God wants you to go through this world beat down. Now, should I find joy in worldly things? No. I should find my joy in Christ. But to wake up every day and be miserable? What kind of life is that? But if you want to be contented in your walk with Christ. If you want to be contented in church, especially in church, let me in, let me tell you, I'm going to put you in on a little secret. Listen, listen, but don't really listen. See, but don't really see. And you'll be much happier. And I'm not saying to walk through here and be ignorant. I'm saying this. There's a lot of church stuff that I need to listen to. But then I need to really stop and go, what is it that you're actually saying? And what is actually truth? There are things that I see and I perceive. And then there are things that I have to stop and go, okay, what am I really seeing? Case in point. So many times, there are children who come into church and act a fool. So many times, there are grown-ups who come into church and act a fool. See, you thought I was going to talk bad about the kids. So many times, there are grown-ups that come in here. There are children that come in here who have never been in church before. Some of these folks have rarely been in public before. And they just don't know. And every churchism would say, 
This is how we handle them. Guys, I want you to think for just a second. We've got a really rowdy bunch of kids in this church. Amen? Amen. 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 I've heard it from all of you. Don't worry. My kid's one of them. She's probably back there tearing stuff up right now. We got a rowdy bunch of kids. Guys, I'm going to let you in on a secret. We got a rowdy bunch of adults. Y'all don't know because you're too polite to tell your stories in front of each other, but I know. We've got a rowdy bunch of adults. Listen to me. See that there are kids that turn this corner and run and almost knock each other over. And we're mortified. They're running in church. Guys, listen, they're running in this church because they've been removed from every other church. They're here because the last church looked at their parents and said, get them out of here. We don't want them here. You see, you can't have it both ways. You can't pray for God to bring children to your church and then pray that God would settle down and get rid of the children in your church. Christ came and he saw And if you think, oh, pastor, you're being too lenient on them kids, listen to me. I'm super grateful that Jesus came and he saw. And then when the religious leader said, stone her to death, she's wild. She's wild. Stone her. I'm super grateful that Jesus went, why? Who else here hasn't done something wild? Who else here hasn't sinned? I'm super grateful that that Bible story does not end and Jesus picked up the rock and clunked her in the head. Because I would have read that and been like, well, there's no hope for her. There's no hope for me. It's that passage that gives me hope because he listened, but he didn't listen. He was not swayed. He saw. And if that bothers you that he didn't hit her in the head, you're going to hate the end of that story. After they drop their rocks, he walks over and he goes, who convicts you? And when she looks around and says, nobody, he says, and neither do I. All right, so listen, maybe the song that we should be singing is, we got a bunch of kids in this church tearing stuff up. Maybe the song that we should be singing is, we got a lot of adults in this church that are going through some real nasty stuff, but they're in this church. They haven't given up hope. When the world has told them, be done with it, be over it, go the secular route. When the world has looked at them and said, this obviously ain't working, you have grown ups in this church going through the worst things in their life who are in this church. So instead of looking and going, well, you know what so-and-so is doing, I'm rejoicing that there is a God who is just as patient with you as he is with me. And man, I'm sorry that your sin ain't my sin. But you know what? I got my own. I'm too busy over here praising God that he's been patient with Matt Walker to be throwing rocks through all your glass houses. Because it, it, let me tell you, that high horse, let me tell you a secret about a high horse. It's easy to get on. It's the getting off that's a problem. We have to look at this scripture and we have to say, no matter who, This servant is that God is sending. Look at what God's response is. Look at what God's response is. For those that are in their sin and are unrepentant in their sin, who have made other gods in their lives and have worshipped those other gods. Look at verse 25. So he poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, 
but even then he did not understand. It burned him up, but even then he did not take it to heart. Like I said, I got here in my brain and went, if we end in chapter 42, you go home and you're like, Pastor Matt was mad at all of us. And God is mad at all of us. Because let's just be honest, how many of you go home and keep reading to the next chapter after church? Exactly. Put your hand down. All right. So here's the deal. You can sit there and you can bake in that. Yeah, God's going to get those unrighteous people. Right? Let it get, get y'all fired up. Go to chapter 43. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Woo! Go back, go back just a minute. Go back to, just for a second. They are looking for someone to scream, restore. We are looking for someone who will say that we have come to ransom you. Chapter, or verse 24 of chapter 42, who gave up Jacob to the looter? Who gave up Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? Listen, when we sin, God says, I have given you over to your sin. I have given you over to your debased mind. I have given you over. If you want to sin that bad, you go out and you live in your sin. And there's two options in that. Option A, I enjoy my sin and I relish in my sin and I find myself surrounded and engulfed by flame. Option two, but now, says the Lord, the one who created you, O Jacob. I love that he uses their names. The one who formed you, O Israel. You don't be afraid, for I have redeemed you. Stop right there, because we don't understand redemption. We think, oh, okay, well, he, he redeemed us. What does that really mean? Big Daddy Weave has that great song. It's on KLTY. I am redeemed. And y'all jam out in the car, unless you're like me, and you're like, ugh. It's one of those that got worn out. He has redeemed you. What does redemption mean? Do you know what redemption means? What is redemption? Huh? You got an answer? To be redeemed. What is redemption? To be redeemed. You can't answer it with the tongue. What did you say? Bought back. Bought back. All right. I'm going to put this in the greatest. It helped my brain understand this. You have a coupon for a free pizza. Look at everybody getting all excited. What are we having for dinner tonight? Pizza. Why are we having Pizza. I got a coupon, baby. I got a coupon. You better believe it. Y'all want breadsticks? Are they free? <laughs> no, just the pizza. I'm good, buddy. I got a loaf of bread at home. We got breadsticks at home. I have a coupon for a free pizza. I show up at Pizza Hut, at Domino's, wherever, and I walk in and I say, hey, I'm here for my free pizza. Try this today. Go to Pizza Hut. Walk in the door and say, I'm here for my free pizza. And they're going to go, what? You, you can't just have a pizza. Well, I'm here for a free one. You cannot have a pizza. You can't just take a pizza. And then you pull out that magical piece of paper. <laughs> See, they used to print coupons on paper, kids. You used to be able to walk through H-E-B, and that's what you did when you were with your mama in the store. They had them little red things. Ooh, you went ripping all the little things out, and the people would come back and go, quit that. And you're, mm, sorry. I had my piece of paper, and you walk in, you set it on the deal, and they see the paper, they see the coupon, and they look at you and say, we'll be back in a minute. And they come out with that pizza. And you go home. Guys, listen. Something has to be redeemed. Something has to be given in order for that free thing to be loosed. I own this, and I'm not just giving it away. You have to have something that knows it's been redeemed to you. 
When Bible says, fear not, I have redeemed you, I have bought you. There has been something that I have given on your behalf. Listen, for the Israelites, what did God redeem? It was the people of Egypt. It was the Assyrians. It was the Babylonians. I have taken them out and I have bought you at the cost of them. Assyria will be no more. And I have bought your freedom at their expense. And when you say, why would God do such a thing? He's about to tell you, because you are my people, not the Assyrians. For us, it's much simpler. God did not hand us over. God did not deliver us at the expense of Mexico or Iraq or Iran. He gave us Jesus Christ and he bought us at the expense of Christ. Death deserved a payment for my sin. Death was owed because of my sin. And God said, because I love you, I'm giving up my son to stand in your place. I have redeemed you at the cost of my son. When we talk about redemption, we have to understand the price that was paid for us or the new song that we sing doesn't really mean a whole lot. But when we understand, guys, listen, such a stupid analogy. But when you understand and you come home and you slam that pizza down on the kitchen table and the kids are eating it. And you're like, you know what the best part was? And they're like, what? You're like, this was free. And they're like, how did you do that? And you're like, I had a coupon. And the kids are like, oh, we sure are thankful for the coupon. Listen, some of you understand this. Some of you have been this poor. Some of you remember sitting there on a Saturday morning before you went to the store, before H-E-B pickup curds, I think when you actually had to go into the store, you sat there. I can remember being a child and sitting there at Christmas time, at Thanksgiving time, Saturday, you know, with a big stack of coupons. Boy, you're sitting there cutting out coupons. Hey, we use gain detergent. That's a dollar off a of gain. You better take that coupon. You're thankful for those things. Man, if you're so thankful over a coupon for a free meal or a free oil change, guys, how much greater... How much greater is the redemption through Jesus Christ? This isn't a one-shot thing. This is an enduring redemption for each one of us. And it's not only for me, it's for every one of you who would be redeemed. Look at what it says. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. And you are mine. Oh, it gets better. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the very rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. This is not a promise for your physical safety. Please do not start a bonfire and say, God told me that I could walk through it and not be burned. I can assure you, you will be burned. Now, can God do those things? Surely. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are proof of that. There's a reason their story is in the Bible. It is great exception which the Lord showed to them. Please do not go through the waters and think, I'm going to pass through like Moses. I assure you, you will drown. But when the darkness is overwhelming me, 
when the anxiety is overwhelming me, when the world is overwhelming me, when my sin is overwhelming me. God says, I'm not going to abandon you. I will be with you and I will pass through it with you. For I am the Lord your God. I am the Holy One of Israel and I am your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom. He tells them how they were redeemed. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you. And I did this for one reason. Because you are precious in my eyes. And you are honored and guys, I'm going to tell you the ESV, I don't know how it reads in your Bible. Just a beautiful, straight up three words. You are precious in my eyes and you are honored and I love you. I give men in return for you and people in exchange for your life. And the one he gave in exchange for my life was Christ Jesus. I don't know why every pastor, I don't know that I've ever heard a pastor preach on Isaiah chapter 43. We spend so much time in the New Testament, we're scared of the old. Walking through the old forces us to take on really challenging verses like 4219. It also gives us amazing verses like 434. God says, I love you. I love Israel. My people. Those that have been called by my name. There's no simpler way to put it. I love you. And you are precious to me. And guys, what a blessing today. That those of us, Paul says, who have been called, have been elected by the blood of Jesus, that God's promise to us still today is, I love you. That resounding, I love you. The great question that will keep you in suspense as you study the word is not, does God love me? The answer to that is yes. He just told you, I love you. If you want to get real deep into theology, if you want to get real deep into biblical study, here's the question that I want you to leave pondering. Ready? Why? You tell me that you love me. Why do you love me? Great deep question. And let me, I'll give you a heads up. I'll push you in the right direction. It has nothing to do with you. Go study God's character. Go study who God is. And you will relish in why. Because he's good. And that's who he is. And so for those of us who are sitting here today, who have been brought out of darkness, who have been called by his name and been told that he loves us, guys, you should leave here singing and shouting that new song, singing and shouting, praising from the mountaintops how gracious and how good God is. For those of you that are here that don't know, I'm going to tell you this. He just told you, guys. You are to be confronted with your sinfulness. You are to be confronted with who is the Lord of your life. One path will lead you to yourself and will lead you to flames. One path will lead you to peace and to grace. And he offers you the moment today, the crossroads. He's tugging. And if he's tugging, if he's urging, if you know that you are a sinner... Let me assure you, God can save you. Guys, as we pray, I pray for each one of you. If you're here today and you know you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to come talk to me. I want you to find me. I want you to find somebody and just say, hey, how, do, how can I know that I have eternal life? And I guarantee you, almost everybody in here can share with you the gospel. If you're here today and you know that you're saved, 
beyond any shadow. If I looked at you and said, if you died right now, where would you go? And you go, I'd go to heaven. And if I ask you why, you say, because I have trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If you know that, you should not be quiet about that. You should share that with everybody. And don't hit them with condemnation. Don't hit them with all your church isms. You go to them and say, hey, you know what? I was a wild failure. And look at what Christ has done in my life. Look at the hope and the joy he has given me. And I promise you, those chains don't last forever. I promise you, that darkness, it does not last forever. I promise you, he can pull you out of it. I promise you. Let's pray together, church. Father, we just come to you, Lord. We love you. We thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for everything you do for us and for who you are. I thank you, Father, that these verses, while they lift us up and tell us that we can come out of dark places, moreover, God, they shout. They tell us to shout of how glorious and how mighty you are. And I pray, God, that that is the song on our heart. Father, that it's never about us, but it is about you. Father, that as we look to our salvation, we remember how great and how glorious you are. And so, Father, I pray that as we walk out of this place, that we leave here with joy, that we leave here telling everyone about the glorious God who has saved our soul. And Father, if we're here, if there's somebody here and they don't know you, they don't know that they have a relationship with you, they don't know that if they died right now that they would go to heaven, they're just not sure Father, I pray that you don't let them leave this building until they know. I pray that you heap conviction and let them know that they can be saved. Father, I just pray that you just watch over us, guide us, help us to return back to this place next week. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.